Thank you for tuning in to this joint presentation by Business and Arts and Canadian Stage. We're pleased to bring you a conversation with renowned arts leader and turnaround king, Michael Kaiser. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope this is on. Can you hear? Um, it's a great honor to be here. Um, as Ren said, it is the first time I'm working in Canada. And so you can all sort of discount what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> But I have three of my, I run a fellowship program. I've been doing that for the last 18 years. And I have three of my fellows here who've taught me about Canada, Sarah Bauman and Ben Dietschy and Jean Lesage. So if, if I say things that you feel are inapt to your situation, you can blame them. <laughs> um, I have spent a lot of my, my life, the last 35 years, working with troubled organizations, primarily, not exclusively, or organizations that were facing some kind of major change. And, in this time, I've been studying because arts management is a very young field. Um, 50 years ago, there was no field called arts management. And so we are all, in a way, pioneers, those of us who are trying to codify and understand how arts, are, are, how arts organizations function and how they misfunction. And I've spent this 35 years really trying to study why did the organizations I was asked to run, why were they so sick? so I could start to develop a model of what creates health. And so I'd like to talk about that model. I do call it the cycle. And it's really pretty simple, and, and some of you will think simplistic, but it's much easier to talk about than it is to do. And, and so let me, let me talk and say that the very first thing I've learned from running arts organizations is the thing that is most required for health in the arts is really amazing art. And it's astonishing to me because so many organizations that are facing financial challenges, the first thing that gets cut is art. And I'll argue that I've looked now across the world at organizations and most of us feel some kind of financial pressure. And I have found that more and more of us are planning our art to a budget than our budget to an art. And as a result, our art is not necessarily as daring or, or wonderful or dreamy as it needs to be to compete in a world in which there's so many other forms of entertainment. And so I'm a believer that art comes first and second and third. Um, it has to be wonderful. It has to be interesting. And I'll use the word surprising. Um, I find that arts organizations that do the same thing every year, plus or minus 3%, pretty soon lose their interest to lots of people in the community. And while I can't tell you how to make great art, I'm not an artist myself, I will just say one thing about the making of art, which is I believe the arts organizations that plan their art fairly substantially in advance have a very large advantage. And I won't go into all the advantages now, but I will say that I believe that most arts organizations need to plan their major projects three to five years in advance. Not every project. You want to leave room for innovation, change, excitement that emerges on the spur of the moment. But when the biggest projects you do have a time to gestate, they end up, they end up better, they end up richer, and it's easier to raise money for them. Um, I wish creating great art was all we needed for healthy arts organizations, but it's not. We also then have to market that art. And I break marketing into two kinds. One kind I call programmatic marketing. And programmatic marketing is the kind of marketing we think of as arts marketing. It's what we do to get people to buy tickets, come to our exhibitions, um, enroll in our classes. It's the email blasts, the posters, the advertising, the direct mail pieces, it's all that stuff. And programmatic marketing is changing radically because of changes in technology. But I'm more fascinated by a second kind of marketing that I call institutional marketing. And what I mean by institutional marketing, it's the marketing we do to get people to say, this organization is so amazing, it's so riveting, it's so inspiring, it's so much fun my life will be richer if I engage with this organization. It's not about selling next Thursday's performance. It's about people wanting to engage with an organization. And I'm not using the word branding because frankly, I think too many arts organizations waste too much money on logo design, 
tagline design, stationary design. Um, most of us do not remember the logos of each other's organizations because we don't have the money to promote them the way Nike has $200 million a year to promote their swoosh. Um, but I'm more interested in a different kind of institutional marketing rather than logo design. I'm interested in the moments we create that get people to go, wow. And let me give you an example of that from my past. Um, as Brendan said, I did run a, a, a dance company called the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. I believe they're coming to Toronto pretty soon. Isn't that right? And um, the Ailey company is now celebrating its 50th, 60th year, excuse me. And um, I was there sort of midway. Uh, and when I got there, they were sort of bankrupt. Um, and this was 1991. Alvin Ailey had been dead for a year, a wonderful dancer named Judith Jamison was his, art, was his replacement. She had been a great Ailey dancer. And Ailey, at that time, performed around the United States. They performed around the world. They were on television. And my board, when they hired me, said, we don't know why we're bankrupt because we're so famous. And then shortly after I arrived, the author Alex Haley died. You may know Alex Haley as the author of the book Roots. And we at Ailey got thousands of letters of condolence because people thought Alex Haley was Alvin Ailey. <laughs> and that told me that we were not quite as famous as we thought we were. And I'm afraid that's true for almost all of us in the arts. Um, we think everyone reads every marketing brochure, every advertisement, every article, every review about us, and they don't. Um, so I had to do something to explain to my community in New York City that we did not write roots in our dance studios. <laughs> and so I'd like to talk very briefly about what we did, not because any of you would want to copy exactly this, but because it might give you an idea of what I mean by institutional marketing. And it started in December of 92, when um, we got the, our company onto a TV show in America called Donahue. I'm not sure if Donahue ever made it here to Canada. <laughs> All right, so Phil Donahue was the man before Oprah. And we got an hour on his show um, where Judith Jamison talked and was interviewed and where our dancers danced and where um, we had the full hour and 18 million people saw that television show. If that's all we had done, it wouldn't have had that much impact except to make us feel good because marketing, you know, you have to do and you do and you do and you do and you do. But that was a first start. The next month, January of 93, was President Clinton's first inauguration. And I wormed us into that. Um, there was a gala the night before the inauguration, and I wormed our way onto that. Um, they didn't want us in the worst way. They had Michael Jackson and Barbara Streisand and Fleetwood Mac and Aretha Franklin, um, but they were embarrassed to say no. I, I tricked them. So we got on, the, <laughs> we got on there. It was on prime time television. 88 million people saw this. Um, I also knew that there would be, a, uh, at the end, a curtain call with all the artists on the stage. And I knew they'd have the new president, Clinton, there. And I knew they'd have Barbara Streisand on one side and Michael Jackson on the other side, because they were the most famous. And then they'd have the, all the others. And I knew my dancers would be stuck in the back, because they weren't so famous. So I knew there'd only be one take of this. So I told my dancers they would get a bonus if they got to the front row. <laughs> So in every photograph, in every newspaper in America the next day, there was the president, all my dancers in their yellow costumes, they were in their dance costumes, and poor Michael Jackson fighting for his life in the back row. Um, but we got the picture. That's the picture I wanted. Um, in March of 93, we did a big exhibition at the Smithsonian, the big museum complex in Washington. And this was an exhibition about the very humble origins of the Ailey Company and how it had grown to be an international touring company. And this, I love exhibitions for performing arts organizations. You know, in the performing arts, we have to recreate our performances every night. It's very expensive. But an exhibition you can create and then it can sit up for three months and you can use it for donor cultivation and such. So I believe that every five years, every organization has an important anniversary. This was our 35th. Not, not usually such an important anniversary. I made it an important anniversary. Do an exhibition that shows your history, shows your, your contributions to your community. Do it in a community center, a university library, whatever, a theater lobby, whatever you have that you can find. It, it's a wonderful donor cultivation event. July 93, 
Um, we did a big free concert in Central Park in the middle of New York. Um, as I said, it was our 35th anniversary. Um, it was Philip Morris' 35th anniversary of giving money to the arts. At that point, they were the largest giver to, to dance in America. So I went to them and said, it's our 35th, it's your 35th, why don't you fund this dance performance? They said, fine. Um, 30,000 people came. Very importantly, I set up a set of bleachers. They, you couldn't see the stage very well, but you could see the audience, and that's where I put my donors. Because they had all seen us dance a lot, but I wanted them to see 30,000 people loving the company. And equally importantly, CNN covered this, did a two-minute segment that they ran 48 times over the next 24 hours. Every half an hour, internationally, there was Alien CNN, which was great for us. In August of 93, the city of New York, I have to, hate to say it, but Mayor Giuliani, <laughs> named West 61st Street in New York City as Alvin Ailey Place. It is still Alvin Ailey Place, even though the Ailey Company has now built a beautiful new building somewhere else. Um, in November of 93, we published two books about our organization. One was the autobiography of our artistic director. One was a book of photographs about the history of alien photographs. And in December of 93, exactly one year after Donahue, was our New York season, and we opened with a big gala for our 35th, and we had Anna DeVere Smith, and Jesse Norman, and Al Jarreau, and Dionne Warwick, and Denzel Washington, and Maya Angelou, all participating in this amazing gala. Everywhere you turned that year, there was Ailey doing something mission-driven, exciting, that got people wanting to participate with us. In 1992, before we did all this, our annual fundraising was $1.7 million. In fact, our fundraising had been $1.7 million every year for five years in a row. And I was told when I was hired, you will never raise more than $1.7 million for Alvin Ailey. That is all there is in the world for Alvin Ailey. By the way, today they're raising $18 million. So the board was wrong. <laughs> I know it never happens here, but it does happen in New York. In this year, when all this was going on, our fundraising doubled to $3.4 million, and we paid off the entire historic deficit in the one year. Why? Because with all of this good stuff going on, people wanted to join what I call the family. And when I talk about family, I'm not talking about artists, and I'm not talking about staff who are family too. I'm talking about a different family. I'm talking about the people around the organization who do things for us and have no obligation to do it and aren't being paid to do it. I'm talking about our ticket buyers or our visitors if we're a museum. I'm talking about our volunteers. I'm talking about our donors. And very importantly, I'm also talking about our board members. When the art is amazing, and the marketing is, particularly the institutional marketing is strong, people want to join the family. Most arts organizations have families that are too small. And because they are too small, they don't have the resource base they need. When the family is happy and engaged, they produce money. What's the symbol for dollars here? Do you use this? Do you use that one? Okay. Thank God. All right. <laughs> Just different color, okay. <laughs> and very importantly, when this money is used to fund more great art that we market really well, the family gets bigger and happier. And through this funny technique called fundraising, we can get more money. And this cycle characterizes the healthy organizations. Again, what's interesting to me is when organizations hit a financial bump, the two things that I see get cut most often are the art and the marketing. And when the art and the marketing get cut, the family gets a little bored, or they just get a little bit less inclined to invite their friends along. And we end up cutting the money we get, and then we cut again, and it gets worse and worse and worse, and that's when arts organizations get so sick. I'll give an example of this. I ran a ballet company in New York called American Ballet Theater. It's a large ballet company in New York City. And seven years before I got to American Ballet Theater, 
they had taken a trip to London and they had self-presented, meaning they took the financial risk, and they, no one came, and they lost millions of dollars, which they had to borrow from a donor who wanted the money back. And so they came back to the US with very little money, and it was time for their New York season. ABT performs every year at the Metropolitan Opera House every um, June and July. And they said, what should be our featured ballet for the year? We have no money, and we can't do anything new. So well, last year we did Romeo and Juliet, and it was very successful. And audience loved it. Critics loved it. We have the sets. We have the costumes. The dancers know it. The orchestra knows it. So it'll be cheap. So why don't we do Romeo and Juliet again? So they did Romeo and Juliet a second year in a row as their featured ballet. It's harder to market when you do a work again. The family got a little bored. A few people stopped buying tickets. A couple of donors dropped out. So they had a little less money. So now it's the next year, and it's time to pick their featured ballet for their Metropolitan Opera season. And they said, we have less money than we did last year, so what's going to be our featured ballet? Well, we don't have any money, so let's do Romeo and Juliet again. We have the sets, we have the costumes, dancers know it. So they did Romeo and Juliet a third year in a row. Now the press is getting hostile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now people are not buying tickets, and the donors are dropping out. And believe me, there's so many other places to, to um, give money, so the donors were happy to go somewhere else. Now we have much less money, so the next year their featured ballet was Romeo and Juliet. Seven years in a row. That sounds like a ridiculous story, but is a true story. And by the time I was hired, the family was down to the dancers and their mothers and fathers. <laughs> And there was no money whatsoever for point shoes, for lights, for anything. So we do it to ourselves. That's an absurd story, but it's a true story. And I feel like we in the arts really need to make sure that we're focusing on how do we make the art as great as it can be? How do we make it as exciting as we can be? How do we stop saying we have $22,000? What can we do for $22,000? but rather let artists say, here is my dream. This is what I want to do. And then how do we do this on a repeated basis, doing really strong marketing, being very, very aggressive in our institutional marketing, and then very importantly, being very welcoming and embraceive of people so that they want to be in our family. And I find that there's many organizations that are frankly a little cliquish that aren't so great at welcoming new people in. I, I worked with a museum in, in Dallas, Texas, a big museum, and they needed to increase their fundraising pretty substantially. I asked, there were three big donors, and I said to them, where do you really want to raise more money? Um, do you want more donors? Because these three people sort of owned the museum in a way. And they said to me, we would be very happy to have new donors as long as we don't have to sit with them at dinner. <laughs> this is a true. Now, when people say that, obviously, that means they really don't want more people in the club. And we have to be sure that we are welcoming people into our families, and especially that we're welcoming into our families board members who are going to be extremely happy, healthy, and productive members of our family and the leaders of our family. One of the things I didn't say about the Ailey story, but I, I should say, which I think is critical, is one of the reasons why Ailey was able to double its money and why Ailey today has a budget of $40 million, it was $6 million when we did this, um, is because our board members got so excited by the institutional marketing efforts. I find that our boards are often passionate about us and our missions and our work, but embarrassed about us for one of a number of reasons. In the Ailey case, they were embarrassed because our financials were so poor, and they didn't want to bring anyone into board meetings and have them say, you know, what are you, why did you bring me into this mess? Our, you know, you're, you're such a disaster. 
what happened when we did all this institutional marketing was our board went from feeling like they were having to trick their friends into giving us money to having their board, their friends say to them, this is a pleasure to be part of this. Look at all the good stuff that's happening. Look at how visible this organization is. I want to be part of that. You're doing me a favor by involving me in this organization. And so we took an organization that was bankrupt and by really attending to its institutional marketing, that is taking what was a great company that was doing really interesting things. And most troubled arts organizations do really interesting things. But what happens is we get paralyzed and we think we only look at the problems and we only look backwards and we only say whose fault is it or when did it start or why is this the problem rather than exciting and enticing people. And so when we do all this backward looking thing, we, we make it very, very hard for the organization to attract new funders, new friends, new ticket buyers, new subscribers. My first organization I turned around was a little ballet company in the middle of America called the Kansas City Ballet. Um, I promise you, selling ballet in Kansas City was not easy. Um, <laughs> Kansas City is right in the middle of America. It is, um, it's a wonderful town with, with lots and lots and lots of money, actually. There's some big companies in Kansas City, but ballet certainly wasn't going to be, um, wasn't on the top of everyone's list. And when I got to the Kansas City Ballet, there was only one topic of conversation, and that was who approved the purchase of a $56,000 cannon for the Nutcracker production seven years before. This was like a sleuthing operation. <laughs> No one involved with the purchase of that cannon was still working at the ballet company. But who's, this was the mark of why they were in trouble, was this cannon. And no one could let it go. And everyone spent all their time talking about something that happened seven years before. No wonder nobody wanted to participate going forward with this organization. We tend to look backwards too much. We tend to explain our history too often. And we tend to talk to new donors or new prospects about all the things that happened before. The great moments and the bad moments. Even the great moments. Imagine you're a prospect to be a funder to a great organization in Toronto, and all you hear about is something that happened a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. All we're telling you is what you missed. We're not telling you about what we're, you're going to experience if you fund us. And so I think one of our big challenges in the arts is to turn the focus from what happened before to what's going to happen. And that requires a discipline. That means it is not that we don't learn from the past. It does not mean that we don't analyze where our mistakes were. But what it does mean is we have to be extremely, extremely clear that what wins us health and happiness and money is talking about the good stuff to come. And for me, what this cycle says is we have to be talking about the art to come. And so when I say I would love for arts organizations to think about their art three and to five years in advance, one of the major reasons is I want you to have a larger menu of projects to talk about. I want you to have a wider set of projects that you can explain that a new funder is going to experience and maybe help fund. Because if they, if they can get excited, then you're going to bring them into your family. And if we can do that, then if we can keep doing that, one donor by one donor, exciting our donors one by one, more and more and more, we have a chance to build this wonderful family. To me, one of the great assets of an arts organization is its family of supporters. And if we can keep that group enlivened, engaged, proud, excited, inspired, then we have the tool we need to move forward. I want to say one more thing about the cycle, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. And that is, well, I'll just stand over here and speak loud. Um, we make one other big mistake, I think, in the arts, which I really, can you hear me? Okay. I really, 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 really want you to, to listen to this, because so many organizations make a mistake, which is at the wrong moment in their histories, they take m money out of this cycle and do two things that many organizations do around the world 
and one of them might be more American than, than Canadian, but you'll tell me. The first that I know happens here too is we take money out of the cycle and build a building. <laughs> hmm? Now, there's nothing wrong with building a building, but only when this is so healthy, when your family is so large, when this has been going on for years, and the family is so generous and so in love with you that they are happy to give you an extra big gift to build the building, but it's not going to affect your operating money, meaning it's not going to affect your art. Because there are too many organizations, and this is true in every country I've worked in, and I've now worked in 84, that too many, this is the 84th, um, where the art suffers when the building's built. And then people are surprised that somehow we're not doing well financially and we have this beautiful new building. Look at the most famous arts building on the earth, the Australian Opera House, the Sydney Opera House. Classic example of a gorgeous building that's been a mess since the day it opened because they weren't ready for it. And it's also not a very well-designed opera house, but that's another story. <laughs> it's a beautiful building, but it was built to be a concert hall, not an opera house, and the opera company stole it from the symphony and it doesn't have the features you need in an opera house, but that's okay. Um, the other thing, and again, this may not be Canadian as much, but, I, but it may be, is to take money out and build an endowment. I have nothing against endowment efforts. I think endowments are fantastic. If anyone hands me one, I'm so, so, so grateful. But the problem is, when we go into an endowment campaign, we do the same thing as when we build a building, which is many of our donors give to the endowment campaign and not to operations, and then we end up suffering. We can only have an endowment campaign, again, when our family is so healthy, when our cycle has been operating, and when we now are ready to take some money out of the system and put it in the bank and only take the interest. Again, I love endowments, but I think, do you do, you do endowments here? You do endowments here, yeah. Boards love endowments because boards love anything they think will cut the annual fundraising requirement. <laughs> and the problem is, right? I mean, you know that's true. The problem is you're being tricked. Um, endowments don't cut the annual fundraising requirement. All you do is you increase the budget by the amount of the income on the endowment. So if you're getting an extra $100,000 from the endowment a year, you just increase your budget by $100,000. You still have to raise the same amount of money. So don't believe that endowments cut fundraising requirements. I love endowments. I think they're fantastic at the right moment in the history of the organization. But organizations can make themselves sick going in an endowment campaign. And they can make themselves sick going in a building campaign. Let us remember that I do not know one arts organization on the earth that whose mission statement says our mission is to have an endowment or our mission is to have a more beautiful building. Our missions are about our art. And if we really want to build healthy, happy, sustained families, then the first and most important thing we need to attend to is that our art is amazing. And Please, please don't think that all these other things are going to make you healthy. What makes you healthy to start with is great, exciting, inspiring art, and then build the supporting structures in marketing and fundraising in board development that are going to help you continue to build great art. But you can't take a vacation from making great art and think you're going to be healthy. Thank you very much. Hopefully my mic is turned on. Are you going to give me that? These mics are just for the recording. Oh, OK. Good. Got it. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you. It, uh, you your focus is wonderful. And uh, it, it's something that we all, I think, from time to time need a good reminder. And you certainly gave us that. Michael, talk to us about boards a little bit, because I, I know you have strong views on that. I love boards. Um, <laughs> Boards have five main roles to help us plan and to make sure the plan's getting implemented, to really understand our budget, to hire, fire, and compensate the people who report directly to the board, to help gather resources, 
and to serve as ambassadors for the organization. Those are the five roles. They don't pick costume colors. <laughs> In the plan, they're approving the arc of the seasons to come, and I do put a five-year artistic plan in a plan. I'm not saying the board doesn't approve that, but their job is not to say, I like this dancer versus that dancer, I like this work versus that work. That's not what the board is there for. If you don't like the direction your artistic director is ta taking, change artistic directors. But you can't design art like by committee. You have to maintain a perspective, and you have to trust your artistic leadership. Tell me about tenure for board members. <laughs> Everyone loves term limits. I don't. Um, I do believe in term limits for chairs, but I'll talk about that in a second. It's common, everything I'm about to say, most experts think I'm totally wrong. I, I'm just letting you know, but I tell you why I believe it. Sorry, I just looked at my CEO over there. <laughs> I believe in board changeover, but I also believe that some of us have these astonishing board members who know so much, do so much, contribute so much, and are perfect. And when those board members' terms, suppose the term is two, three-year terms, let me make that up, those are normal, could, could be a term. And then after the six years, that person has to go off the board for a year. If you think this marvelous, inspiring, hardworking, generous person sits home for a year and cries until they come back to your board, they don't. They find something else to do. I don't want to lose those people for a minute. I believe we want term limits because we're chicken about firing bad board members. And I believe that we have to be willing to say to someone, no one has a birthright to be a board member, to say to someone who's not producing what the board needs at that moment in time, we have the right to say, I'm sorry, you've been a great board member, but as you know, our plan suggests we need new things from our boards going forward. Would you be willing to give up your seat to someone who can better fulfill those needs? I'm sorry to have my back to you. Um, that's a totally fair thing to say to a board member. If we're chicken to do that, we're gonna have lots of dead weight in our board, and dead weight weighs down the good board members, and dead weight makes it harder to bring on new, wonderful board members who are gonna be really productive. Going back to Ailey, at the same time as I was doing that institutional marketing campaign, I had to fire 18 of my 36 board members. Now when you say, why are you doing it, your staff, why wasn't your board chair doing it, it's because he was chicken. Um, <laughs> But we were a $6.5 million organization, and we had 36 board members, and 18 of them combined was giving $5,000 a year. $5,000 a year from 18 board members. No wonder we were going bankrupt. These were wonderful people. Of those 18, 16 had been on the board for 35 years since the day Alvin founded the organization. And they were wonderful, but they were no longer appropriate governors for our organization. You know, we have a life cycle, and just as we know that over time we may need different kinds of staffing, over time we need different kinds of board members. And we tend to, and when we start an organization, need board members who sew the costumes and do the bookkeeping and do the marketing. In this case, one of our board members had sewn the original costumes for Ailey in 1958. And she was an amazing person, and she knew more about the Ailey Company than anyone. And she was a great asset and a great family member. So I made her the archivist, and, which is what she really loved. And she, was, she knew she was no longer a good board member. And when I sat her down and said, Mickey, I really think your time has come, and we want you to be the archivist, but we think it's time for you to give up your seat. You know what she said to me, which is what 90% of people over my career have said to me is, thank you. I know I'm not the right board member, but the board members who aren't being good board members are just as embarrassed to say, I'm leaving, as you are to say, I think it's time for you to leave. This doesn't have to be done in a public way. It doesn't have to be done in an embarrassing way. You do this in a humane way. And of the 18 board members we asked to leave, 17 stayed in the family, and one walked off it and will never speak to me again. But that was important change so that we could then replenish the board with people who could really help us. And they powered the growth and the health of Ailey for this last 25 years. So please, don't think of term limits as an excuse for firing board members, and think whether they really serve your organization well. Uh, the comment that uh, you were charged with asking board members to depart 
uh, leads in my mind to the issue of uh, boards are responsible for governance and management for managing. So you were forced to step over that line. I was. I'll be honest, this is not a popular point of view, but I believe staff has another role with respect to governance, which is I believe staff's job is to teach the board about really what's going on, really what the constraints and opportunities are. The truth is, this is not true of every board member, but it's true of many board members. They simply just don't know that much about the organization. I know that sounds arrogant as a staff person to say, but it's just true, and I see a lot of nodding heads, and you're all getting fired tomorrow, because I want you to know. Um, but, but the truth is, we have to have a more mature relationship with our boards than boss subordinate. We have to have a give and take. We have to have a collaboration. I love my boards, and I love my board members, and it was a true give or take. It was not them saying to me, you better do this, or you have, that, that's just not smart when I'm spending 80 hours a week worrying about my organization, and they're not. They have great insight, they have great connections, I want them engaged, but what I don't want is for decisions to get made without the full story. And, and if I could just say one more thing, which is I'm very focused on how do you get board members engaged in the work of the organization more. And I found that what we tend to do as managers, we make a mistake. We think of our board as the board. And we think of this monolithic body of people that we speak to every now and then. And really what we have to remember is our board members are individuals with individual interests and passions. We tend to do in the arts many different things. Even the smallest arts organization does many different things. We might do exhibitions, and we do education, and we do outreach, and we do all kinds of stuff. Not every board member is interested in everything we do equally. So what I try and do is I try and in an unofficial way to get each board member, or as many who will do it, to adopt a project, to make themselves the unofficial godparent for that project. They don't run it, but they get involved, and they learn, and they get deeply ingrained. If, it's, if they love education, I let them talk to the teachers. I let them watch the students do the work. I let them really learn the project. At the Kennedy Center, I had a donor named Helen. Helen loved our international work. She got so involved in that work by learning about it and being part of it that when we did a big festival of Nordic culture, we sent Helen to, to the Nordic countries, um, to Copenhagen, Oslo, and Stockholm, where she made speeches in the American Embassy about why she gives money to the arts and why people from that country should too, and how it was meaningful to her. This was a great thing for her. It was a great thing for us. It didn't, she didn't get in the way of forming our festivals, but she was so ingrained and so proud that she became the major sponsor of all of our international festivals. So I'm trying to get board members to really adopt a project. And I use board members, board meetings, less for every committee giving the sort of boring report, and more for board members to talk about the projects they really care about. And when 10 members of your board each love a project, and they talk about it at the board meeting, their, their excitement and their engagement is palpable. And when they get that excited, they want their projects to be successful. So they start to ask their friends and associates to get involved. And that's when they become the most productive fundraisers. So rather than saying, just go out and raise money for us, we let them really engage in something and feel a responsibility and an attachment to a project. And I find that makes much healthier boards than boards that just come to meetings and go home. Uh, when we met this morning, you surprised me by talking about the number of donors, smaller amounts, and the, the total funding that came from that, I think that that's something that we uh, are not doing, certainly in the organizations with which I'm involved. And uh, it was inspiring. I'd like to hear more. And, and this may be peculiar, peculiar, peculiarly American, sorry. Um, one reads about the big mega contributions. And certainly when it comes to capital campaigns, you can't build a building typically without these mega contributions. But on an operating basis, the majority of the money is coming from what I would call a mid-sized donor. Depending on your organization, what mid-sized mean, let's say somewhere between $1,000 and $20,000. So not the $100,000 donor or the million dollar donor or something that you might read about in the newspaper, but those many, many people who can give you $1,000 or $1,500 or $2,000 a year if they feel really attached to you and really part of your organization. 
And I find that too many of us are looking for that angel, that one big person or those two people who can give us this mega amounts. And we're not building our families large enough with these 1,000 or 2,000 people. At the Kennedy Center, by the time I left, we had 30,000 individual donors. There were some who were only giving $50, and there were some who were giving mega amounts. But the heart of the effort was that $1,000, $5,000 donor. And so many people in this city can give that level. So, so how do you look after those people? I, I, I don't just send them letters when it's time to ask them for money I, once a year. Um, I make sure that I'm talking to these people on a regular basis, even in sometimes incredibly short and informal ways. I stand on the steps of every performance. I talk to people as they come in. I get to know them. How did we get on the Donahue show? The way we got on the Donahue show was I stood on the stage, on the steps of every Ailey performance, and I noticed this one woman kept coming. So I said to her, hey, you, I noticed you keep coming. You know, who are you and why do you keep coming? Turns out she was one of the producers of the Donahue show. That's how we got on the Donahue show. It wasn't magic. It wasn't because we had some special pull. Many of us don't know who's in our audience, really. We're not getting to know them, and we're not really sharing tidbits. I find we in the arts sometimes want to hide information. Somehow we want to be mysterious. I don't do that. I bring people backstage for an act of a ballet and let them stand and watch the thing happen. And th they never forget that. And, and when you do that, they're yours for life. I guarantee it. Um, and is it slow going one couple at a time? It's slow going. But that's how you do fundraising. And that's how you start to get them interested. And, if, and they might start at a low level. Let me go back to that Helen person who, did, who was so interested in our international festivals. I met Helen because she was a $50 donor to the Kennedy Center. John knows Helen. And, and Helen was a $50 donor. And then she went up to $500. And because of that, she was invited to something called the Golden Circle. And she was allowed to come to some meetings that we have with $500 donors where they hear about our plans. And I would talk with them and sort of, again, build this relationship. And I had just started, and I was talking about my first big project that I wanted to do at the Kenny Center, which was a very large festival of the works of Stephen Sondheim. And I had this idea. And after the meeting, Helen came up to me and said, you know, my mother just passed away, and she loves Stephen Sondheim. So I want to give you 500 for the Stephen Sondheim Festival. So I said, great. You know, she's a $500 donor, and now she's giving me another $500. We don't. We doubled from the meeting. Good meeting. And the check came in for $500,000. <laughs> Nobody knew Helen's grandfather had invented the light that's on the mine, coal miner's helmets. <laughs> and every time a coal miner goes down, she got money. <laughs> and so did we. Um, I didn't know that. And you never know. And I'm not saying you're going to get a $500,000 gift, but whew, that was a good day. Um, <laughs> We have to share, we have to engage, we have to think of them like family. I use the word family on purpose. It's not just like a cute, clever word. I think of them like family. I share with them, I bring them in. I make them feel part of the organization. I share tidbits of information other people don't know. I give them a little surprise announcement before I tell it. One of my favorite things I would do with my bigger donors is the night before we announced the season to the world, I would have a group of 20, 25 donors come to my little living room, and which is not very big, believe me, and I'd give them a glass of wine and a peanut, and I told them the season before anyone else heard it. That was my best fundraising technique, because they felt so in the know and so special a, to learn before everyone else, and B, to be invited to my living room, because I don't invite many people to my living room. You know, you, you remind me of a great restaurateur. They stand at the front door, they greet you, they thank you for coming back, and they take you to the table. Because you want them to come back to the restaurant. We want them to come back. In. We want to make a habit of people coming to our organizations. And we want to create a social life for people in our organization. The more someone feels that their personal happiness is tied up in our success, the more successful we will be at finding resources. And if we have those resources, then we can do the art that we want to do. Uh, so Clyde, I'll stand at the front door with you at the Sony Center. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, questions from you, please. 
What suggestions do you have in terms of marketing and fundraising for art service organizations who are not creating the art, rather supporting the artists who are creating? Yeah, it's a great question and a really hard one, isn't it? Um, service organizations have a harder time because you don't have that, that direct link from the artist to the donor. But what I try and do is I try and collaborate with my members who are creating the art, and I work to try and create events, and I'll give you an example in a minute, events that no one of them could do. So for instance, I, I worked, did some work in a, in a town in Michigan called Grand Rapids, and one of the things we did was with the funding agency, which was a service organization, was we created a performance that involved the local opera company, the ballet company, the theater company, the dance, modern dance company, and we created this mega performance that ended up raising huge amounts for Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is not a big town. But what it did was we were the convener, if, if you will, we the, so, the service organization, and created something that was really profitable for them, and of course we got our share too. So I think we can do some really interesting and innovative programming by collaborating with the members of the service organization. But it's definitely harder because you're involving, you need the goodwill of others who are also out there looking for money. No question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. What is your view on fundraising galas and events? After <laughs> They're exhausting. And if you don't make a lot of money, you feel like it wasn't worth it. Yeah, but I will tell you, yeah. I'll be honest, I love galas. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why. A, I believe if you get your family engaged and excited enough, you can actually make some real money at them. But even that aside, where I think we fall short is, I use galas to meet my next major donors. People who buy tables and invite their friends and associates. We make the mistake, I think, in the arts that we might write a thank you letter to everyone who bought the table, but we don't necessarily work the gala. My rule at the Kennedy Center was none of us got to sit for the galas. We worked. We went from table to table. We had target tables, people we wanted to meet who were not donors. We got to know them, we got their business cards, we talked about the organization, and we did an active follow-up the next morning, as exhausted as we were. And we figured out who's going to see who. And we used those events. This is a truth. We built a very powerful fundraising engine at the Kenny Center. By the time I left, we were raising $82 million a year for operations. 67% of our major donors we met at galas. That's the God's honest truth. So I know how hard work they are. And I know sometimes if the family's not large enough, the return on investment looks low. A, work on that. But B, really do thorough work on following up with the key people who came who aren't donors. And your return on investment starts to look pretty darn good. So I love them. I won't give them up. But let me say one more thing about galas. Don't do the same thing every year. Don't say, this is what we do. Not for seven years in a row. Right. <laughs> Don't have 8,000 speeches. You know, do something that involves your mission. Show your work. Make it great and exciting and pithy. But don't say every year is the exact same stuff. Too many organizations do that. And they get stale, and you gradually lose people who start saying, well, I'm busy that night. You know, I'm out of town that night. They're not, but they're just bored. <laughs> so keep it fresh. Again, you, the element of surprise, I think, is a really important element in the arts. If, if I had done a survey of the Kennedy Center audience, what works would they like to see most? And the Kennedy Center does multiple art forms. Every year they would write in, they would have, I don't do those surveys, I don't believe in them. They would have written in Beethoven's Ninth, Phantom of the Opera, and Swan Lake. <laughs> now Phantom of Opera would be replaced by Hamilton, but that's, I'm no longer at the Kennedy Center. And yet, if you ask someone one-on-one, -on -one, which I do everyone I meet, what was your favorite arts experience? Never, ever, ever do they say Beethoven's Ninth, Swan Lake, or Phantom of the Opera. It's always something they couldn't imagine that surprised them. We need to learn from that, and we need to be a little bit more willing 
to do something new and different and, and risky as we go forward. The ideal gala starts at what time and concludes at? Depends on where you are and, and the cultural norms of your community. Um, in Washington, D.C., where there's a lot of Congress people who go to bed very early, you really want to end by 9.30. Um, but in New York, you don't. It depends where you are. Um, you know, uh, we have a question coming from, as I call him, the $15 billion man. We are very fortunate in this city um, because of the love of the arts uh, that we get from City Hall. We have uh, Councillor Paula Fletcher here with us and uh, Councillor Gary Crawford, both of whom uh, sit on the TO Live board. And uh, uh, fortunately, Gary is a practicing artist. He paints, he paints well. I've seen my, many of his works. And uh, the floor is yours, <coughs> Council. Give us um, your thoughts on the role of governments in funding the arts and arts organizations. Speaking of... Oh. Please say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love government funding, and you know, I come from a country, it's always embarrassing for an American to teach arts management abroad, because you know, in our country we get very little direct government funding, and it's because we were founded by a group of English people called the Puritans who thought music and dance were evil, and so we've had a separation of art and state since 1720 or whatever it is. Um, and that's an embarrassment. We are not proud of that. It did mean we had to learn how to do fundraising a little earlier just because we didn't have the government money. Um, but I love government funding. I believe government funding is critical, particularly to fund those projects that aren't going to naturally find private support and that are critical for building a diverse and um, multifaceted cultural ecology for our cities. So I'm a huge believer in government funding. And in my dream world, the, there's a conversation between arts organizations and the government to really make sure that we understand where, where is our arts ecology, where do we want to move it, and where does that money do the most good. Um, again, in, our, in my country, that doesn't happen, um, but, but I am fully supportive, and I believe government funding is absolutely critical for healthy arts ecologies. I didn't cost you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, so I'm involved with an organization that's had the same artistic director for decades. Um, but it's changed unexpectedly, and we're very concerned about not wanting to alienate the family. So do you have any suggestions or tips for organizations where we've had this long institutional history? We want people to feel excited about new changes, but not feel as if we're turning our back to what's gone on in the past. It's a really hard question and a good question, and a real question, because a lot of us face that. Um, I do believe you have to let the new artistic leadership have their vision. I don't think you can constrain new artistic leadership, say you have to be like the old leadership. The selection process that the board goes through has to be thinking about this as they make a selection about how is the new artistic leader going to carry on and build on the on the foundation that was, that was established by the prior artistic director. My only suggestion, and I say this for any leadership change, artistic or executive, is make sure that you're communicating with your donors. And I don't mean by sending out emails. I don't mean that. I mean conversations. I mean sitting around in a room and talking about, here's what my plans are. Here's why. Here's where I think we need to go. Here's how the world is changing. Here's how our arts are changing. And here's how I think we need to respond to it. I find that give and take to, and the explanation, but also giving your public, giving your family a chance to talk back at you, I think is critical. And this is particularly true as our traditional donors age out. And as we're looking to bring in younger people into our families, younger people today don't want to sit in a room, be talked at, and they want to respond. They want a two-way street here. And I support that entirely. When I went to, to London to run the Royal Opera House, it was a very, very surprising, to say the least, to the community that an American was brought in to run the largest cultural institution in, in, in Great Britain. Um, but also, the, the Royal Opera House was really in a mess. And had I was their fifth chief executive in four years, which will tell you something about the mess they were in. And they had a $20 million deficit. 
um, American dollar deficit. Um, and so this was a huge mess. And what I did was I went around all of England and then Great Britain, but I started with England, city by city by city, talking to anyone who would talk to me, having gatherings like this, explaining what we were gonna do, explaining the mess and why it was there, explaining how there were so many great things to come that no one was talking about because we were all looking backwards, looking at that cannon. And I was talking about, <laughs> we had the largest arts education program in Europe. We were about to open the most high-tech opera house in the world. And we were about to open a second space that any arts organization in Great Britain could use for free. And on and on and on. We were go I, had a, I had a good story to tell. No one was listening before. So I went out and talked one-on-one. -on -one. And I find that if you have a new artistic leader with a new perspective, make sure they're not hiding in their office. Make sure they're not just speaking through their season brochure. Get them out in front of people. Get them talking to people. That interchange, that exchange of ideas, I'm telling you is critical to bringing your family along as you change pretty radically as your organization may. Yes, uh, back to Robin, the board of experts. We have a board around 25 or so. Some people say, oh, that's ridiculous, too many people. I'm, I'm guessing you might favor a bigger board. What is the goes on in your mind with the size of the board? Sure, the board it's, a good, it's a good question. And, and I'm gonna equivocate a bit, so. I'm gonna say it depends on the organization, and let me say it this way. All things being equal, I like boards that are larger than smaller. I don't mean 100 people boards, which we have in America for some symphonies, but I don't mind a 30 person or a 35 person board. But, and here's the big but, remember I talked about trying to get board members involved in a project? To do that well, it means that the board member, the individual board member has to have a relationship with someone on the staff. It doesn't have to be the CEO. Some CEOs are like so nervous about letting board members talk to other people on the staff. I'm not, I think it's great. And so my friend Helen, who loved the international programming, by the way, Helen was so much part of the family that she moved into the apartment next to mine. That's my <laughs> there's a price. To, there's a price to pay for everything. <laughs> but Helen built a relationship with the woman, the wonderful person who curated our international festivals. And my rule of thumb was board members need to have a monthly communication with the staff person who's the, the, re, the relevant staff person. So Alicia, who was my curator of international programs, and Helen talked at least once a month. Some organizations can only handle 10 or 12 board members that way. And some can handle more. So I think it depends on the size of your staff, the ability of more staff members to build these relationships. And I don't want a board that feels they're only talking at board meetings. But I would like, over time, organizations to be able to handle a few more board members, because I want more ambassadors out there helping me meet people. OK, I'm coming away with a to-do list that's frightening. <laughs> Frank. I'm the past president of this club, and uh, very arts-oriented, located in the heart of downtown Toronto. And so many of your remarks to us this afternoon are relevant to the success of this club and our outreach into the arts community. So I would encourage any of you young people here in the audience today that would like to learn more about membership in our wonderful club <laughs> to pick up the brochure or, the, or have a word with me or with Diana Wiley. But uh, I for one would love to thank you for because what you've said about the performing arts organization applies equally as well to an organization such as us that is ancillary to the arts community in Toronto. I have a feeling that if you had a group performing at Bill Clinton's gala, your guys would have been in front of my guys. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thank you. Question on subscriptions Ooh. and uh, subscribers. Do you think that um, model of revenue stream is dead? No. Good. I don't think it's dead, but I think we have to think a lot about how do we price subscriptions. You know, we in the arts over the last 40 years have increased our prices, not all of us, but many of us, very, very substantially. I'll give an example from the States, and I only use this because I have to know the numbers. In 1960, 
a prime orchestra seat at the Metropolitan Opera in New York in center orchestra for one performance was $10, okay? Last year, that ticket was $300. That means it went up by a factor of 30. Inflation in that same period went up by 7.5. So the Metropolitan Opera has raised orchestra tickets four times the rate of inflation. It is not surprising that not only are their subscriptions way down, and they used to sell subscriptions of nine and 12 tickets, and now they're selling them of three and five tickets. But, last, but in 1960, they sold 96% of their seats, and last year they sold 61% of their seats. So we have to be careful. People's lifestyles have changed. They travel more for business. They buy more last minute. Subscriptions are harder to sell. We have to make sure they're not priced in crazy ways, and we have to make sure they're really flexible so that people, when they have to travel for work or when they can't come that next Thursday, we make it really easy for them to exchange and for them to be flexible. But I don't think it's dead. I love subscriptions, not just because they sell lots of tickets and not just because they reduce the cost of marketing per ticket and not just because we, they finance us and give us money early, but one of the major reasons I love subscriptions is they give us artistic flexibility. When you sell a lot of your tickets on subscription, it makes it easier to do that daring, challenging work. But when you sell every performance on its own merits, it becomes harder to do that daring piece. So I really do believe in subscriptions, and I work very hard with my organizations to find ways to boost it. It doesn't mean it's not lower than 30 years ago. It is. The biggest reason it is, is because more women work outside the home now than did 30, 40, and 50 years ago. And women have been the majority of the subscribers to arts organizations. So as more women work outside the home, it became harder for them to commit to a subscription of nine performances or eight performances or whatever it is. But it doesn't mean we can't make it work and fit into their lifestyles. We just have to work really hard and listen to them. I really do focus groups. I listen to people talk about what would make it easier for them to buy. Sure. Yeah, um, in my 15 years of fundraising, um, I've seen a decline in corporate sponsorship. Corporate yes. Support. I'm sure that's the same in the States, uh, as they've shifted to other sectors. And um, I'm just wondering if you see uh, this at some point coming back in some way and no. how it might come back? I don't see it coming back. I find corporations have changed why they give. It used to be that corporations gave to be good corporate citizens. Um, and now that shares are owned all over the world, they care less about being good corporate citizens in a given city. If you think it's hard here, try Hartford, Connecticut, which used to have seven major insurance companies, all that were managed in Hartford, and now not one of them is managed in Hartford. They're owned in Germany and Sweden or wherever. And so all of a sudden, the entire corporate funding base dried up. And corporations are looking for visibility for their gifts. They think of them as marketing investments now, not good corporate citizenship investments more and more, which means that, that they're funding the most visible, biggest organizations. And so most of us just don't have much ability to build our corporate line. I just focus where the money is, which is individuals. Yeah, it's great. Sir, just on, on that note, uh, do you think that uh, arts organizations are largely competing for the same donor wallets, or is there a pool of money there that's, that's untapped? I think we traditionally have f competed for the same donor wallet, because in each city there's 10 or 20 or 50 d people who give these huge gifts and who we all go to. But those people can't fund everything, and I think we make a mistake if we think those are the people we have to go to. My goal is to diversify my family and to start finding even modest donors far afield from those big families. Again, I'm not saying I don't want those big gifts, but I don't only look at the big gifts. And I'm thrilled to work hard to get a $500 gift or a $1,000 gift. Just remember, Helen's gift started at $50, and now she gives $500,000 a year. So, so, so. I'm not saying you're going to get that $500,000 your donor, but we can work the donors up. And so I really do not want to focus exclusively on that one group that you can name in any city, and I'm sure you have them here in Toronto, 
of the families and the people who are so generous and so wonderful and who we adore, of course we want to cultivate them and thank them and acknowledge them, but we also want to look beyond. And I don't think we do that hard enough in an organized way, in a systematic way, and in a way that really shares with them, with people, so they want to become part of our families. Any other questions? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, I, uh, in terms of smaller organization, let's say in Toronto, the boards are usually volunteers. Yes. And what would be your good advice just for these volunteers who kind of goes beyond like not being paid, but go to community, and usually the artistic director is part of the board as well. So the kind of operation is carried along that line. But what would be your advice for them? I don't think it's any different than I would give for the largest organization. Do some interesting work on the scale that you can afford, and then really try and market your organization in an interesting way, not to the whole earth. You don't need everyone in Toronto to love you. You may want to serve everyone in Toronto. That's differently than needing to raise money from everyone in Toronto. And focus who you're going to try and raise money from. Create a smart prospect list. Not of the richest people who give money to everybody else, but who do you know, who cares about your work, who can give you $10 a year, or $50 a year, or $100 a year. Cultivate that group, add to it, add to it, add to it and it can grow exponentially. I, uh, last question. Very briefly, when it comes to boards, you outlined very clearly uh, some of the skills you look for from board members and the corresponding responsibilities. Should there be a minimum ticket, a financial ticket, an expectation that would be uh, across the board, or do we accept that people bring different things? What you're, you're opening a can of worms with this one. Just want you to know. <laughs> I believe that the notion of everyone having to give the same amount is a little dated. And I tend to create what I call the ideal board structure for, my, for the organizations I do plans with. Not one level, but tiers of levels. And what kinds of people can help us, but might give at different tiers. Because in most boards, board members don't give the same amount. But we discourage bigger giving sometimes when we say the amount is X. And so I, I do want something meaningful from every board member, but I think it doesn't all have to be the exact same amount. I, but it's a bigger question. That, I'm sorry, I'm giving a short answer to a very long question. I have the privilege of extending our appreciation to you. I'd like to begin by saying congratulations to Alexandra and her team uh, uh, who are here, artistic director, and Monica, uh, whom uh, we have known for some time. Um, you are back. I think this is a wonderful introduction to all of us. Uh, Michael, I'd like to say to you that uh, the turnout uh, is important in our city, not in terms of numbers, but who's here. Uh, we have uh, chairs of many of our organizations. We have uh, CEOs and artistic directors. There's a strong representation of the creativity that goes in, on in Toronto. You've made a real contribution to the conversation that we have, and we thank you profoundly. Thank you very much. If you like this video, please do share it. To be the first to know about future talks, visit our website and sign up to our newsletter at businessandarts.org slash newsletter. For more resources like this, visit our website at businessandarts.org slash resources.